Please be seated. Two years ago today, at 9.35 a.m., a young man entered the Sandy Hook Elementary School and fatally shot 20 first graders and six school staff. He then put the semi-automatic rifle he was using to his head and took his own life. In the aftermath, a comprehensive array of programs to support the recovery of survivors, especially the children, has been put in place. A mental health agency in Newtown has quadrupled its staff to meet the demand for services. The school system has developed a long-term curriculum to teach kids how to manage their feelings. Teachers have been trained to identify students suffering from trauma. There is even something called the Newtown Resiliency Center, offering art, music, and play therapies. It is anticipated that this elaborate support system will be needed for the next 12 to 15 years in order to see the youngest survivors into adulthood. Today, flags throughout Connecticut will fly at half-mast from sunrise to sunset. Two months before Newtown, in October of 2012, a Taliban terrorist in Mingora, Pakistan, stopped a small school bus packed with children and teachers. A second Taliban member climbed on board from the rear and demanded, who is Malala? No one said a word. But several of the girls turned to look at their friend, Malala. She describes what happens next in the prologue to her book, I Am Malala, the girl who stood up for education and was shot by the Taliban. These are her words. That's when he lifted up a black pistol I learned later it was a Colt 45. Some of the girls screamed. Moniba tells me I squeezed her hand. My friends say that he fired three shots, one after another. The first went through my left eye socket and out under my left shoulder. I slumped forward onto Moniba, blood coming from my left ear. So the other two bullets hit the girls next to me. One bullet went into Shazia's left hand. The third went through her left shoulder and into the upper right arm of Kanet Riaz. My friends later told me that the gunman's hand shook as he fired. By the time we got to the hospital, <clears throat> my long hair and Moniba's lap were full of blood. Days later, complicated and risky arrangements were made for Malala to be flown out of Pakistan to a hospital in Birmingham, England. Her recovery was slow but sure, and eventually her family was able to join her. On December 10, just four days ago, and barely two years after that terrifying day, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 2,000 years ago, a Palestinian peasant woman 
received troubling news from an angel. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, the angel said, and you will name him Jesus. We all know this beautiful story by heart. And if you are like me, you love the story. It really doesn't even matter whether it's a true account. We can still imagine the startling rustle of wings. Mary's halting yes. Her rush to be with Elizabeth and the joyful greetings between the two women. Luke tells us that Elizabeth exclaimed with a, with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mary's response, we can imagine, was equally ecstatic. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We know these words as Mary's song or the Magnificat. It shows up every year during Advent as a canticle, and it is part of the evening prayer service in the Book of Common Prayer. But for the most part, for the most part, Mary's prophetic prayer is profoundly disconnected from our experience of the Christmas story. Listen again. He has shown great strength with his arm and scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know when I say that ours is a murderous age, marked by massive injustice and the violence that adheres to grinding poverty on the one hand and to the protection of privilege on the other. First century Palestine was no less so. Who was Mary to speak to that? A Jewish peasant girl, probably young, although the text doesn't say. She had no money, no prestige, no power, nothing at all to counter the might of empire. And yet, she found a voice with which to speak holy words into the chaos and fear that marked her life and the lives of those she loved. She found a voice with which to speak holy words into the chaos. The Magnificat has been called a troubling text. Why? Because it does not make room for our mushy, sentimental notions of Christmas. Because it demands that we pay attention to our own troubled context because it urges us to take up Mary's song on behalf of every man, woman, and child who suffers. How do we, who are more proud than humble, more powerful than oppressed, more rich than poor, how do we receive such difficult words with thanksgiving? Do we get it? that Mary was chosen by God to bring forth not a rosy-cheeked Christmas mascot, but what one of my preacher friends called a swaddling wrapped revolt. What would happen 
if we allowed Mary's words to sink deep into our awareness. There has been so much bad news this week. But I wonder if we can listen with the ears of faith for Mary's song in the midst of all of it. Could it be that protesters wielding signs that say black lives matter, could it be that their signs are their own version of Mary's song? Could we consider that the careful, deeply loving responses to the Newtown tragedy are expressions of all human longing for harmony and peace? Listen, if you will, for just a moment to a brief excerpt from Malala's Nobel Prize acceptance speech. What kind of song do you hear from this Muslim teenager? This award is not just for me, she begins. It is for those forgotten children who want education. It is for frightened children who want peace. It is for those voiceless children who want change. I am just a committed and stubborn person, she says of herself, who wants to see every child get a quality education, who wants equal rights for women, and who wants peace in every corner of the world. Dear sisters and brothers, she says, let us become the first generation to decide to be the last. Let this be the last time that a boy or girl spends their childhood in a factory. Let this be the last time that a girl gets forced into early child marriage. Let this be the last time that an innocent child loses their life in war. Let this be the last time that a classroom remains empty. Let us begin this ending. Let this end with us. And let us build a better future right here, right now. I am here to tell you that body cameras, tightened airport security, all the congressional world, uh, congressional hearings from now until kingdom come, stricter gun laws, bigger pre prisons, any of these things might be necessary, they might be appropriate, I don't know. But none of these things will save us what will save us, what will move us toward a safer, more livable world will be the joyous songs of justice and hope rising up from the hearts of people everywhere who have heard for themselves the rustle of angel wings and the whisper of a call to be with their own bodies, with their own lives bearers of the good news of God. And now I invite you to rise. And turning to page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God.